So thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Trevor, our general manager here. We're going to show some lots of pictures here. I got a few plants up here to show you too. I brought some of the things that maybe we can't get as much later in the season. So if you like any of them, and some stuff with some cool winter color too. Um, some things a lot of people look up and say, why'd you bring the dead plant in here? But <laughs> we call that chocolate in the nursery business. So there's some cool plants with some fun color. And these are really cool. I got one in my yard too. Um, so we'll show you a few. Uh, pictures everybody's got the handout um, and that's going to give you some tips you can take home as well um, we're going to talk a little bit about planting first um, so the possibilities are endless and I, I brought up a little small sample here we probably have a couple hundred different conifers out there from the tiniest to tiniest to stuff that grows very large so we've got a huge amount of selection um, a big one with me is foliage color you know we have a lot of green in Washington there's nothing wrong with that. That's why we have rainy springs and winters to so keep everything nice and green here through the year. But there's a lot of different tones of green and there is a lot of blues, yellows, different colors that we can add in because these are plants that are going to shine all through the season. You'll also see some things I'll show you that turn colors in the winter and then go back to a different color here come spring as well. Um, the growth habit is huge because this is probably the one class where that magical word dwarf is sometimes meaningless because I think if I said dwarf to any of you, you would picture in your mind this little tiny thing that's never going to get very big. Be really careful with the term dwarf and conifers because the dwarf version of this is still going to get 12 feet or 8 feet or 6 feet, much smaller than the nominal species. What you probably want is miniature and that to me in the conifer world is something that's going to be small. We're going to grow an inch or two a year, not have any maintenance. And unfortunately, that means the third point there, you pay for what you get, because that's going to be a little on the pricier side. If my grower takes another two years to grow it to get this big, it means I have to pay a little more for it, which means the customer does as well. So this is really one of those things to me, you pay for what you get. You know, if you want something really cool and trick and miniature, you're going to have it for an entire lifetime. It's not going to outgrow a pot or your garden but it's going to be a little bit more expensive in the beginning you can almost look out there and see gallon plants and one's 20 and one's 40 and one might be 50 or 60 yeah that's the one that's growing just an inch or so a year it's going to be very very small okay um, lots of different textures and even on the greens you know I have a lot of green in my yard as well but I'm always looking for different textures if I've got something with a stiffer structure like a pine with a softer foliage like a cypress um, there's lots of options in there too for textures even if you do want most green. I love yellows myself. I have some customers that think sometimes yellow needled or yellow foliage plants look like they need fertilizer so that's kind of a personal thing. Um, if you like yellow great because I think that brightens up in the area but some people just don't like yellow it's like sweet well we can do different greens or some blues as well. Um, now if we talk conifers in the entire world it really comes down to only two kinds of basic plants what we call world conifers if you think about your christmas tree you know i've got a tall symmetrical upright trunk and i've got rings or whorls of branches if you think of the noble fir um, a lot of the trees we have in the evergreen state here are going to be world type conifers maybe a bigger plant sometimes sometimes not so big but maybe a little bit harder to prune, to be honest with you. If I have a world conifer, I can tip the growth on the edges. I can shear it a little bit, like a lot of times our Christmas trees get sheared, so they're nice and full and dense. But I can't wait three years and then decide I'm going to go back and cut it back to the way it was. We can never, ever cut an evergreen back to bare wood. That means we just go back and take the trunk, right, the branch right off the trunk. It will never regrow a needle. So as long as we're being careful with pruning and doing it consistently, every year or every other year and never cutting into bare wood is the way to go on worlds. Maybe the little bit easier type to prune is what we call random branch conifers. So our junipers and cypresses, hemlocks are like that, cedar trees. There's a lot of plants that we can shear and get denser and fuller and not have to be as careful, again, tip pruning to control the size. So it doesn't change the fact I still am not going to cut this to ever into bare wood, but I find most people maybe have a little easier time looking at a, an arborvitae or something like that and going, oh yeah, I can tip that and I can prune it and it just gets thicker or denser without having to, to, to get the, the dead wood, okay? 
Now, this is a huge one today because this is a question I get in a lot of classes and I'm starting to mention the difference of these two type plants as we go through this year in every class I do. So you're going to find plants out there that are field grown, right? We dig a, we go out in the winter time mm -hmm. when they're dormant, we dig a root ball, the guys wrap it up in burlap, they ship it to me, I plant it in compost in a container, and then we have it out for sale safety and that way if it doesn't sell right away, it can send some new roots and establish itself and we still have it healthy in the summer, the fall, the winter as we go through the season. But we have to be really careful with field grown plants. We're never ever taking the burlap off. That's the one big mistake I think with a lot of with a lot of gardeners. If I untie that burlap, take it off the plant, pick that tree up and set it in my hole, the chances are that root ball is gonna crack in half or deform itself a little bit and you will lose the tree. Conifers will probably won't let you know for four or five months sometimes before they start turning brown. So please don't take the burlap sack off. When we plant a field grown thing, we're gonna dig a twice as wide hole, twice as deep, amend it with good compost, you know, about a third compost or so to our native soil. We'll get it set in there just as it is, the root ball taken out of the container. Then when we have it backfilled almost to the top at the right level, we'll go ahead and cut that twine off of the trunk and peel that burlap to the sides. Or if you're like me, take the garden shears or your knife or something and you can cut off that excess burlap. Don't yank it out the top or the side, the twine sometimes pulls right out underneath if you want to do it that way, but don't take it off, untie it and then pick it up and set it in there because we'll probably crack that ball. Is that making sense to everybody? Because that's a tough one, not just with conifer, but anything you buy field grown, I would always be a little more careful getting it in the hole. Once we get it in there in the sack, it'll never damage it. We can backfill a little bit, start packing some soil in there, get our food down. Then we can cut that twine and un unfold it where we're, we're safe and hefty. Yes? The burlap, um, but do you expose the top? Oh yeah, absolutely yeah. expose the top. Yeah, because yeah, we don't want any of that excess on there. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got our house kitty coming in here to say <laughs> hi. Um, the other half of conifers, um, you know, let's, we'll say this, field grown, probably a little more value for your money, to be honest with you. You tend to get a little less expensive, bigger plant. They're a little less for me to purchase in like that. If I'm a grower and I have a field of plants, much less maintenance, much less water. It's very easy to manage a nursery ground like that. If I'm growing in a container, I'm gonna have a superior root system, a lighter plant, but if I'm a grower, I have to do manage the water. I gotta watch weeds in the pots. There's a lot of other aspects to growing these things. Some things we can't get feel grown and vice versa. So there's a little bit of that dictates it. But can grown is the other way. If I pick up you know, any kind of can grown plant, you can see in the picture there. Oops, dump some dirt in here. But if I carefully pull it out of there, I'll always have a nice root system I can see. I'm not gonna rip this in half. I'm not gonna tear it apart. We don't wanna damage it again. But I wanna take the tip of my pruner, a little hoary hoary knife, anything that I can just lightly score the outside. Maybe if there's a thick mat of roots at the bottom, I'll maybe chop that off but I'm not gonna rip it apart, open it up, and be, be a little gentle with it. But we do wanna scrape and say, say that little plant, you don't have to grow in a circle anymore. You've got some free soil. Let's go ahead and get going in, 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 into, into the native soil, okay? So everybody good on that, because that's a big one with B&B. &B. Um, I tend to get a lot of specimen stuff in it. It's usually gonna be field grown, whether it's maples, conifers, a lot of the property, um, and just be careful when we take them out of the sack. Okay. You said if there, there's roots on the bottom, you can just cut those You off. can. You know, again, we're not going to cut that much off, but if you saw that hemlock, plants are going to get a nice fibrous root system. When they hit the bottom of the pot, they're going to spread out. And sometimes I have a little mat of roots there. Either you pry it open and loosen it a little bit. A few plants over the years, I've just taken my pruners and just cut that little bottom edge off again. Just lets them know, let's get going into the native soil. Okay? Now, we always use... Whichever type we're putting in there, we're always going to get some transplant fertilizer. So if you want to get a good start on that, mycorrhizae is the key um, in the organic type fertilizers. We do Sure Start, so we would do a little bit of that. For me, what I do, a little bit in the bottom of the planting hole mixed up with our fill, plant the whole thing, and I'll always put one more little rim around the surface to get those, those top roots going a little bit quicker as well. Okay? Now, general tips that I would say before we start looking at, <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of pictures. 
um, like I said, pay attention to growth rates. My favorite place on earth is Isley Nursery. You can go on their website, look at a zillion different options. They've got some fabulous uh, conifers down there, but their tags are second to none. If I pull their tag over, it's gonna tell me everything I need to know on that, including growth rate, which I think is a huge deal with, with, with conifer type plants. Two to four inches a year, six inches a year, 12 inches a year. That's gonna let you know as a gardener what to expect a season and maybe how to attack the pruning. This is, you know, conifers, not these cute little dwarf ones, but a lot of taller ones, I'd say, are the most misunderstood plants because people see something they like, they put it by the front door, five years go by, I can't get to my front door, it's on my <laughs> siding, it's blocking my window, and we're stuck with conifer. We can't cut it back that far like we can some shrubs. So look at the growth rate. They have a garden size on there, not this 10 year crap, excuse my French, because it bothers me when I see nurseries have a tag, you know, oh, it grows four feet tall, three feet wide. Well, yeah, that's in 10 years. I want my plant for 20 or 30, don't you? So we would get that garden size, what it's gonna eventually get to in a typical garden situation, okay? A big one with conifers, and there's just a couple exceptions, is drainage. We don't want wet in the winter. I don't care how much it rains, it's not that but we want that water going through the soil structure. If I plant a plant above hard pan clay, a pine, a spruce, a majority of the things that we sell, and it gets down on the hard pan and the water table comes up, you're gonna have issues with a lot of conifers. We gotta make sure that water's got somewhere to go um, as far as good drainage. Um, soil composition, you know, a lot of times, again, compost will really help, but if you have clay, we really gotta break that up underneath there get some compost in to help that degrade and again get that water with somewhere to go in the winter um, they're really everything's going to enjoy good drainage like i said i'll show you a couple things that we could have in a little bit wetter areas as well uh, sun and shade is obviously a basic thing for all plants um, you know if you plant something that belongs in shade and sun it's going to burn up here in the dry summers if we do the opposite it's going to get leggy open you're going to have a lot of brown down the trunk if it's getting too much shade. So watch that sun shade. Is it morning? Is it afternoon? Is it all day? And then we can find the right plant for you because that's kind of what we're here to do at Sunnyside. We want you to be successful. So if we get the right conifer, you're going to be happy with it forever. We don't have to come back in five years and start over again, okay? Um, fertilizing, you know, I'll be honest, I don't have to feed a lot of my old conifers. I'm not running out there every year to dump 10 pounds of food on an old pine in my yard. I'm watching them if they're healthy and I, you have healthy soil, they're probably healthy plants. If you want to speed it up a little bit, maybe you're trying to block the neighbor or something like that. Um, and certainly when we plant them to get them a good start, we would feed them. But if you went out even once a year coming out of winter, you've got happy plants. If they're off color, maybe we do once here in March and one more time in May, June might help you with a little bit more growth in the summer. But it's not something you should ever have to go out and pump liquid food on or do a regular fertilizing schedule, much, much easier to maintain, okay? Now, one big thing I saw, a lot of people every year come in in the fall, and I can show you some plants out after class that we have left from fall, is what we call flagging. Does everyone kind of know that? If you look out in your, if you look out in the native areas right now, what do we have? Cedars, you know, hemlocks, everything in our native grounds, but the tree is healthy, but if I look in the middle sometimes, I've got a lot of old brown needles. That's not disease, there's nothing wrong with it. The drier the summer, the wetter the winter, which around our neck of the woods is pretty much every year, as that's our climate, you're gonna have more old growth shed or flagging. You know, conifers are quote unquote evergreen. I'm never gonna go dormant, lose everything, but the sturdiest conifers are gonna hold their growth for three years as that next year comes out in spring that summer that old growth turns brown and sheds out. Now if you're OCD like me, you get the gloves on and we kind of clean them out like I do on most of mine every year and you don't see them, it turns to mulch or you throw them in the yard waste. It's not necessary, um, but some years it's more than others. And I would say last year, probably what I saw here in my own yard and examples from customers, probably a little bit more of that flagging happening in the fall during the season. So this pine, it's spruce, if you think of a pine, Walk out, you got a pine tree in your yard, you walk out right now, what do you got? Pine straw, you know, around the base is mulch because all those old needles keep dropping out. There's not necessarily something wrong with it, but that to me 
is when you have to come maybe ask a, you know, me, my hero, the staff at the nursery, <coughs> okay, I've had this pine for years, it always drops brown needles, but man, this year's a little more than ever, and now it seems to be getting out towards the tips. We got a problem. But if I have healthy growth, healthy growth in, and then all the middle's brown, that's just nature. If I have brown out here on the ends of the branches, then we need to get something fixed. We have a bug, we have a tip light, we have root rod, we've got drainage, we've got some other reason that's causing that, okay? Now a big one right now, because we're at the end of the transplant season, if you want my opinion, if you have to move a conifer, or really honestly any plant in your yard, you got to get it done here pretty quick. In fact, I would have done it a month ago, two months ago. We got probably the holiday season to first or March or so every year when they are actually dormant or raining, it's cold, you're going to have much better luck moving, um, especially a conifer that time of year. Never ever bare root. You, that's why we, we buy bare root fruit trees, we buy bare root roses. We can do a lot of stuff bare root, but we cannot do conifers bare root. So if you're moving something, we have to get a big ball of dirt with that, wrap it up, a tarp, you know, burlap, you can borrow, we have lots of burlap sacks, you can borrow some if you need. Um, but we would wrap that up securely, get it to its new home, and get it right back in the ground right away. If we bare root it, I give you zero chance of having it ever live. And that's the dilemma to me with all conifers, especially like we talked about the field grown. It's not going to let you know for four or five, sometimes six months that it's done. Because you move something right now, you'll look at it next month, looks great, I'm, I'm okay. Then we get to July or August and you're like, okay, now it looks really off color. What's going on? And it's typically that, you know, we just didn't get enough root when we moved it kind of thing, okay? Now, if we look through, this will kind of be fast and furious here because I put way too many pictures on here as always. Um, you can, you know, raise your hand if you got a question as we're going through. I'm going to show you a few um, kind of things. I can't see everybody, so i got to move a plan here. Um, so I'll show you a few. This doesn't mean we carry a lot of evergreens on here. I could have probably put 300 slides on here. These are all compliments of my grower Isley. These are the same pictures and growing information you can find on their website for all kinds of plants. There's some really cool stuff on there. Um, so if we start with some firs, that's our AB species. We don't, we're not going to make you learn Latin today. But if we start with some firs, this isn't Douglas fir. That's a totally different plant. This is true fir, like noble fir, Christmas tree, Shasta firs. Um, you'll see a bunch of Korean firs on here because this is typically how we can get a nice dwarf plant. So something like Sis, you can see right on their garden size, foot and a half tall, two feet wide. That's a slow grower, one to two, maybe three inches a year. That's going to just be a nice dark green, easy texture, nice and soft. You're not quite as prickly on, on the true firs, so a little bit softer texture. One of my faves, I brought one up right here, you can see in the class is icebreaker that was a kind of one of the mythical conifers for a few years you couldn't find them around um i will tell you a, a funny story like i said twice you pay for what you get i do the same thing as you guys do i paid 300 dollars for one of those about five six years ago now i think you can get one for like 60 bucks so the price has really come down it's still an expensive plant but it's because again it's low growth rate a little bit harder to graft but it is a spectacular, it looks like a little flock Christmas tree, and that's a really small plant. You're not gonna, again, overpower any kind of garden with that. Um, I had one of these for years, and I made a mistake one summer, and we'll leave it at that, and I lost mine, but I'm gonna get another one here one of these days. Um, Golden Spreader is about as yellow as it gets in the winter. If you like yellow, um, that's a, it's a little bit bigger. This is a great example of a dwarf, Nordman, um, or Caucasian fir, but it's still, mine was probably 20 years old, about three, four feet tall and about six, seven feet across. And it was a great conifer in my garden, but I put too much water on it. Unfortunately, I had a problem with my, my, my home sprinkler that summer. Um, so golden spreader is one we do always carry. If you're into yellow, that's about as yellow as it gets, especially in the winter months. Uh, this is another one I have in my own yard for a long time. I love blues, um, especially the really steely blues. Um, spruce sometimes, a little more prickly. Some folks don't like blue spruce as much. Um, this would be like blue spruce color, but a soft texture. So this is truly a flat kind of rockery weeping plant. 
I've got mine on a bank in front of my house and it kind of goes in between rocks for great for great texture um, it's easy to prune if you ever wanted to but again pretty slow growing I'm a little faster than some of the others but my, again mine's been in almost 20 years now and it's probably a foot and a half tall might be getting six feet across or so because I've kind of let it get in between some rocks which is the way I want it to grow but again anything prostrate or weeping it's very easy to tell them to behave you do some pruning you tell them where to go and then that's what's going to happen this one always makes me chuckle we have a Japanese fur called Hedregat because most of the most of the cool furs are bred in Central Europe and Germany and Czechoslovakia but so they always got some funny names but um, Hedregat we, we weren't able to get last year I put it back on this year because we were able to get a few um, that's a cool fur maybe a little bit bushier like four by four tall maybe five or six wide it's got great structure to it but that's one to me you get all the colors in one I'm gonna look at that plant see blue see green see silver see a little touch of yellow I'm gonna see kind of all those colors uh, together as one now if we look at some cephalotaxis I don't know if anybody's tried they call these plum use or Japanese plum use so it looks a little more tropical somebody before class was mentioning hedgehog you want to somebody found the hedgehogs out there um, you'll see a picture of that here next but cephalotaxis looks like our use but a much thicker needle it looks a little tropical to me um, if you looked at the plant so very hardy very easy to grow but maybe a little different texture um, we have fastigiate which is going to grow like a big fat cigar you want something maybe on the narrower side that's not like telephone pole but a little chunkier and we can use those in pots for a little screen um, I like cephalotaxis because it's pretty versatile for sun to shade and if you know use they always get those little red berries on them in the summer fall the little fruits plum you is going to be like four times that size so they look like little miniature plums when they get their fruits on them uh, later in the summer fall so fastigiata upright and narrow and then hedgehog is a ground eater that's a really good indestructible plant you can clip it make it into a little hedge if you wanted um, or let it sprawl out or prostrate like um, and fill up some area and again we can go sun or shade on those now I'm a Hinoki cypress addict I'll, I'll, I'll say that right off the bat I probably should count how many different ones I have going in my house this has always been one of my favorite conifers I don't like the water much um, the great color You've got a huge amount of choice for growth habit, uh, for spread, for height, all the above. Um, but a really pretty easy to grow plant, mostly for full sun. And again, well-drained soil that you don't want to water much. Um, these are plants, I've had some of these 20 years in my yard, and they're just about as big as me now. So, I mean, they're, they're really slow growing, even some of the taller ones. So, Butterball, to me, would be the superior dwarf yellow. That's got a great name looks just like a butterball I mean just a little tiny couple inches a year grower um, that you can keep very small fern leaf is going to give me a little bushier structure like 10 by 7 or so <coughs> excuse me and I'm going to have kind of that ferny appearance so a little bit more texture on something like fern spray this you can see that says philocoides compacta so that's a great example of what I talked about early. That's the dwarf at 10 by 7. If you bought regular fern spray, you'd have yourself a like 25, 30 foot tree down the road, which is very pretty too, but most people don't like quite that much. So this would be the manageable garden size. We have some that are flecked with white. I have one of these right up here in the front. This is Mauricii. So a little bit bushier, you know, maybe 4 by 3 or so. But if I like that white flecking in the green, that's got great color on it. And that one, again, will take a little bit more part shade, will give you the Christmas variation. We don't have to have that one necessarily in full sun. I brought one of these up. This is Melody right here. And that might be my favorite Hinoki, especially if we go towards that part sun, part shade to shade. This is one that will just glow in the back of a morning sun garden, give you yellow, blue, green, if you like yellow I think that's one of the best introductions I've seen uh, for a number of years um, you're gonna get maybe a I probably disagree with Isley and call it eight feet tall maybe full full grown very slow again but that's one 
again, that we could go for that part sun garden, which I think a lot of people could use some bright foliage for an area like that. We've got Golden Dwarf. We probably sell more of this one than any conifer out in our yard. I got a bunch of those in already, and we'll keep getting more. People like the yellow. People like that soft kind of corally texture. Um, that's, again, one that'll take a lot of dry. That will take sun and not burn up here. If we were in a little warmer climate, I would tell you to put it in part shade. But I haven't had any burn on mine ever, and I get mostly sun on mine in my yard as well. Um, you know, again, four feet by three is a pretty good size. You know, maybe long term down the road, 20 plus years, we might be a little bit taller than that. But still, Anoki is very easy to prune, and you can keep that nice shape to it going uh, without letting it get too big. Uh, Sunny Swirl is a little bigger, and that's the old, we used to call Coraliformis Hinoki, but this one will have the yellow in it. So if you like cool bark, maybe something a little different. Sunny Swirl is a pretty cool plant. Loves dry, but I would see more of a twisty tip branch. I would see some red uh, bark on the ends of the branches, a little bit more exposed. That one almost looks like you've maybe bonsai or pruned it a little bit but you really have and it's got some character if you don't want something maybe quite as dense or formal that's a pretty fun one uh, Suara cypress I have had this one in my place too for about 20 years it's not super blue but it's got a nice kind of greeny blue color to it very soft super dense you know just it again as my example that height and spread is spot on you know I started with the little gallon guy we only get small ones of those um, and my have never touched mine with pruners and it's literally about a foot tall and a foot and a half across It looks like a ladybug Mine kind of got a little branch out the front and it looks like a little head So I call it the ladybug in my rockery This is another one I've had for a lot of time if you want blue um, Some of the saguaro cypress it used to be anyone have boulevard cypress in their yard That's an old-fashioned one that got gigantic You know that was my issue is like I don't have room for that, but I like that plant on a smaller version uh, curly tops is the small one even at 12 even at maybe 10 10 feet down the road that's about a quarter the size of an old boulevard cypress so um, I haven't shared mine again I got the first plant of these when they came out and mine's just barely taller than me and it looks exactly like that like a big blue uh, dense cone right in my front yard in full sun uh, pin cushion if I like yellow a little bit shorter again for a nice hot spot in the yard it's dry that's another one that doesn't get very tall at all might spread a little bit more than that as it gets old but again very very slow growing then we get into some from cryptomerias anybody got cryptomerias in their yard got a couple Japanese cedars not a one so these are fun if I touch this guy up here can you see how different that needle looks it's almost like ropey like um, that's a perfect climate for more of those grow in Japan to where we're on the Pacific Northwest very easy to grow and the cool thing with cryptomeria is a lot of them are going to take on winter color so purples bronzes reds you'll see quite a few out there that have some really fun color on them during the cold months and then go right back to green um, over the spring summer fall if you don't like the winter color there's also quite a few that just stay green and honestly get darker green as we get cold in the winter months this is a big grower here that's really kind of fun. We get a couple of these and they call them the snake Japanese cedar or Erucaroides. They kind of named it after our monkey puzzle trees, a little different. But this is going to have like long kind of curly twisty ropey branches and it, it makes a pretty cool specimen tree down the road if you're looking for something a little bigger. This is one we sell probably the most of for cryptomerias. Uh, black dragon because people want something of manageable height and spread but like the deep dark green color they called that black dragon because again it's brighter green spring summer we get to winter and it gets super dark green they're very easy to clip you could keep that as a little more formal shape if you wanted but they got some fun character as you get an old one as well uh, this is another one I have in my house a golden promise so a little bushier like four by four um, it's really yellow in the winter but it's not as yellow during the growing season so this is kind of the opposite where I'm gonna have nice bright yellow tips here in the winter more of a two-tone green look in spring and summer but something that's never gonna outgrow a typical garden 
and again I can have that in all full sun mine's in my south facing rockery and it's doing excellent if I don't want the color then I get little champion we got a bunch of these in this has been a popular choice uh, for conifer lovers around here um, again pretty manageable size it looks kind of close to this about the same growth habit but we would have something say as tall as me about six feet by six feet which isn't a big conifer and that will give you a nice kind of backbone specimen that you would have there year round then you can do perennials and some fun stuff out in front of it that'll pop the color then we get up to some tall ones and I've got both these in this year but now we've got a big old 25 foot specimen Ren's Dense J came over from the Netherlands a number of years ago that one's going to turn bronzy purple color which is really pretty in the winter and then we're back to green here come springtime but that would be a full size specimen if I'm looking for something that's up there again more in the 20 25 foot size that's green and then there's our yellow option if we want second suji that will give us the yellow tipped one that's going to be a big specimen there's one of these about a block down across the street you can probably see it in the garden still and it's a big tree been there for decades but really really pretty color if we do some cypresses you know this is the container choice it seems like these days anybody got wilma's in their pots the old monterey cypress they work great in the yard too um, we got good drainage and we have dry I have two big versions of these off my patio uh, that I shear every year for two big yellow kind of focal points smells just like lemon that's the best part of pruning these they got great fragrance smell just like lemon pledge but uh, Monterey Cypress um, has got the, the, the color to it it's got the fragrance you can shear it very easily and this is a very nice plant to consider even for a container where I'm looking for a little thriller plant that I can plant some flowers and do some fun stuff around this could be kind of a, a permanent addition in the container that you can swap some different plants out as the years go by <laughs> and we've got some juniper and I always say juniper and the old people like me go Ugh, juniper I don't want those we have those at the house this isn't the old rat's nest you know four foot brown junipers like we had back in the 80s uh, there's some really good junipers to use and juniper serve a purpose a to give me my gin and tonic because that's how we get our gin from the juniper berries but two I'm super drought tolerant you know if I'm looking for something I don't have to water you know again these aren't the old ratty wavy junipers we haven't carried those in years we've got flat ground covers we've got narrow ones a couple of bushy ones too and if I've got a dry hot sun area that I want something easy that can prune even you know juniper still to me serves a purpose there's some really fun ones like Compressa um, looking for kind of that pencil juniper I want something like a foot wide with silvery blue color that's going to give me a really narrow focal point without eating up my yard one of my favorites is the shore juniper I brought one of these up I think I put them down below there um, but that's what give me the gold you know when I put shore juniper in I take salt you know if you live by the water by chance if I've got again a hot dry area even this one being yellow we could do part shade even but I just don't want to water if I water juniper too much it's gonna crash and burn if I don't water it and I neglect it it's gonna thrive so that should be an easy one so again if you're looking for something we don't want to, want to spend a lot of time with <coughs> excuse me no all conifers are not evergreen that's a hard one to explain but conifers all produce cones which is why we call them conifers but they're not all evergreens and there are some really fun needle trees that drop their leaves I didn't bring a big weeping larch in we have these down there but you can see beautiful gold fall color the, I think probably the prettiest plant in spring when it's breaking bud is larch I brought a bush larch in here uh, that we get in that doesn't weep it just grows like a little shrub but you can see the buds are just starting to swell to refoliate it's the prettiest pea green soft color I always admire the larches every year when they're leafing out because that is a pretty plant then we get the bright gold in the fall now being weeping you can see the difference with that sign it says garden size varies with culture how's that for an escape route but it's the honest it's the honest truth if I buy any weeping type conifer not just large a weeping spruce a weeping pine anything it's up to you what you want to do with it if I stake it up 
I could have a narrower kind of plant that folds down on a narrower spot. If I let it crook over, I could have a beautiful low specimen that kind of eats up some more spread, but doesn't grow high. So it's really up to you on how you want to grow them, because I've seen these done in all sorts of fun. Some people twist their trunks up and then let them fall down. I mean, you can do some really fun stuff with weeping conifers, but it's going to be up to you to quit staking it, take the stake out, take the leader out of it, let it go down to the ground. You can kind of do what you like. That's the one I have up here is the Volter, Volterdingen. That's just a fun one to say. So that's a cool variety of Japanese large that would give me more of that shrubby habit. Now this is a plant, I'm still waiting for these to come in. I don't have them yet, but this one speaks hardiness to me. If I said Siberian Cypress, you would probably think like, ooh, I bet you that one's going to be cold hardy. No, we go down in the 40 below zero range with those. And it's not the most common plant. It looks a little like juniper, but it turns color in the winter. So this is one you can see winter color, summer color, green all through the season, and a totally different color tone in the winter. This is something I, I just, we don't sell a lot of them, but it's an option for some people that want something super hardy. You can grow this in shade and sun, and something I just want evergreen filler. I want to plant something, let it sprawl out, and cover up some area so I don't have to weed as much. That would be a nice evergreen presence, maybe to consider for something like that. We do get a cool new variety of that in called Drew's Blue. It's got a nice ring to it. So now we go from green to a little bit more blue color with a little purple in it even in the winter. That might be a better, better color one for you. Now I brought one of these little guys up because this is being a close second. We sell an awful lot of these little miniature uh, spruces. So this is one called Push. Now you can see the cones are always on the tip, which is really cool on a plant anyway. But if you came by here in a month, that's probably the most striking plant in that entire conifer yard because it's bright red. So all that new growth comes out with that scarlet color. Then we develop the cone afterwards over the summer, if that makes sense. So lots of cool Norway spruces out there. We can go from a hundred foot giant native Norway spruce to weepers, <coughs> excuse me, to shrubby ones, to very manageable miniature ones like this. You know, we get some older ones of these, but again, you're talking about a plant that's just going to grow a couple feet tall, a couple feet wide that we can prune if we want to. Spruce loves sun. Spruce is drought tolerant. If you're looking for a fun little shrubby spruce, that's a great one to kind of try because it does have some, some really different colors on it. We've got something like Engelman spruce. I've been up hiking up in uh, northern Alberta a few times, and that's where we would find native Engelman spruce up there, Jasper Park, Banff those kind of areas up in the Canadian Rockies. This is a manageable size, kind of like Colorado blue spruce we would have in our Rocky Mountains in the central U.S. This would be a super cold hardy, you know, zone two, zone three, gets you down there to 30, 40 below zero. We're never going to get near that up here. Uh, but that's got great color. That's kind of a, a silvery blue color. Nice tidy habit again. Loves the heat and super drought tolerant if you like a little different plant. Then we've got Serbians. I brought a Serbian spruce over there. So that's our kind of Christmas tree shaped one. And I always bring up Serbian spruce probably more than any for a taller tree because it's not going to eat up your yard. You know, I don't have a problem even at my place going up. I just don't want a huge spread because I want a lot of other plants to, to tuck in around it. So if you were going to go narrow, <coughs> but get up there 20, 25 feet down the road, Serbian spruce varieties are great options for a specimen tree. That looks like Christmas. It's got green, silver, blue. They're very insect hardy up here. Sometimes spruce has bug issues in our climate. That one is the most resistant to, to different spruce mites, spruce aphids and things. Um, you know, I, you guys know I probably I ran whites for like 19 years down Linwood before I came up here 12 years ago. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. But um, we had a Serbian spruce on our parking island in our lot, and I always admired it. It was there since the 60s, and this is the 90s, early 90s when I started running the place, and it just sat in that parking spot. We didn't have to prune it. We could put Christmas lights on it, but it just never got that huge skirt, they call it, at the base. So much more narrow and upright. A firefly. 
that's an oriental type spruce with a lot of yellow. We don't get a lot of these in, but you can see how tight that is and how bright that is. That's not a big plant for oriental spruce. Again, this is something that would be 30, 40 feet if we bought the species plant. This is only going to grow maybe six feet tall. Much more manageable for a yard. This is a great example to me of what Isley does for all of us who love conifers. They spent 20 years breeding this plant. You know, going back 20 years ago. Just came out maybe five years ago now. Um, they have more and more every year, but they crossed and trialed and does this burn and how fast does this grow and you end up with a great new introduction on a manageable sized garden spruce. And there are some good blue spruce, so we don't get just plain species blue spruce around here. That to me is green with blue tips, you know, as all the cheap blue spruce does. So our blue spruce is going to be a little more expensive, kind of going back to that thing, you pay for what you get. But if I'm going to purchase a Colorado blue spruce, I want powder blue. I don't want green, I want blue, blue, and more blue. So super drought tolerant, super cold hardy again. And you're going to see quite a few out there that we carry from ground covers like procumbens. You know, I've got a sunny rockery or a garden that I just want to cover it up with that blue color. Those are indestructible. You know, our upright trees are going to be dwarf like cesters. You know, Colorado blue spruce, my place in Clayle, and we had them up there probably 30 feet, you know, tall. This is something that's going to be under 10, just a perfect dense blue cone. Uh, with kind of that Christmas shape to it. <clears throat> and then we've got a great weeper called the Blues. There's another example of something <clears throat> I could let arch over, I could stake it up and let it fall down, I could clip it and keep it lower. You know, you would kind of choose what you want to do um, with the weeping types. Hey Trevor, are those uh, pretty well uh, bug resistant? Like the spruce one? is, they're better, but again, I'm always honest in the classes. If I'm planting a blue spruce, I'm really just blue spruce, Maybe Alberta spruce, which I don't put in my show here if you got Alberta spruce. But there's some spruce that, that are pretty prone to the spruce aphid up here. Um, and if you look at your spruce and you look in the middle, they'll never ever touch the outside of the plant because they're smart. They eat the middle and they go this way every year. So their kids get to eat next year's needles because now your new ones came out and it'll never end. If I'm looking into the tree, you will see a lot of brown and not the three years but probably one year and everything else is defoliated, you'll find them in there and we can spray for those or treat the tree is pretty easy to do, but just something certainly to keep in mind. You have to spray that every year? If I had this, if I had one of these in my yard, I would go out every single spring and I would probably apply a good spray to keep them out of there. Yes, that would be the safest way to go. Now a couple of collector things. The Chief, has anyone got the Chief here? That's kind of, you. I knew you guys got one. The Chief was kind of the holy grail for conifer lovers. That's about as cool as it gets. So this is a kind of a fun story. Um, you know, Chief Joseph is a lodgepole pine. So this was found out in the Wallowa Mountains in eastern Oregon. And luckily the logger that was taking the tree down had enough brain to go, that's kind of different. I wonder what that is. And so this is a natural sport that he that was found up growing into a lodgepole pine and luckily he had enough brain to take it out of there, preserve it, take it to somebody and say what is this and can we do anything with it and then we get a new cultivar because they were able to get stable grafts. So it's very hard for my growers to graft this plant. It's not hard to grow but I've heard like 1,000 plants get grafted and about 50 of them grow and make it to the saleable stage and then we're good to go at that point. So it's not hard to grow, I'm not saying that, it's hard to produce. So this is not a cheap plant, um, these are these tend to be you know 50, 60 bucks for a gallon or so and we get a little bigger one you're gonna get a couple hundred bucks for a little bigger one. But this is green all through the season. If you saw this in the summer you'd probably think to yourself why did I pay Sunnyside 200 bucks for this plant? It just looks like a scrub pine. Then we get to October and you're like, now I know why I paid for that. Because over the winter months, it absolutely glows. Almost orangey color some winters, but it is really bright during the winter. So it's really, to me, two totally separate trees. So that's Chief. This is the Mugo Pine. And I brought one of these up down below here too. And I don't mean to disrespect you, Mugo Pine, but I kind of call this one the, the, the poor gardener's Chief Joseph, because that's what I have too. So if you... 
don't want to spend as much money, you can get the gold Migo pine for substantially less and a little bigger plant <coughs> and have exactly the same colors go. I've got green, so spring, summer, fall, and I've got beautiful yellow color over the winter. So I'm going to walk by that another four months or so, it's going to be green. It's not going to have the yellow color to it, but I'm going to be able to enjoy that through the winter months. Some Austrian pines. I got a very good Austrian accent. So we go Austrian pine. You know, we carry Comet. We carry a couple different ones of these. But I want a big, long, thick, dark green needle with a big, bright candle. Those are really striking. You can see that was taken probably in May where they've got their candles up before they unload their new, new foliage for the year. Um, that makes a beautiful focal point for a narrow specimen. We've had quite a few customers. One of my... Uh, good ones up on Soper Hills probably took eight of these to her house over the years and she's got a beautiful row of these along the ne neighbor's fence and then a garden in between them because they gave her the height she didn't want to block everything out and, and miss her view of the water but she's got some really nice focal points with something like the the comet Austrian pine then we have some Japanese pines I brought one right here this is what we call sometimes dragon eye pine. You can see it striped down the needles. This is Ogon Genome. This is another yellow one called Goldilocks. Um, I have a couple of Parviflora pines and I love them. But this over anything else today, any other plant we say needs to be dry. This is one plant we do not ever want to water much and we don't want to put in heavy clay soil. You're going to lose it in like two months, not even wait a year. So make sure you've got good drainage, a good sunny location. I put mine right on the crest of a bank facing south. And I don't water much anyway, but whatever rain comes down goes right through the soil and he's out of there. We just want to make sure we're kind of high and dry on the parviflora or Japanese white pines. Does that stay yellow year round? That's yellow all year. So I'm never going to lose the color. There's blue. I have a blue one in my yard I just love. I can do yellows, blues. I can do narrower ones. <clears throat> Most of the really cool ones like Ogon or Goldilocks are going to form kind of a, a specimen shrub. Not really ever get into a huge tree, but get you something up there 6, 8, maybe 10 feet on some varieties as we get older. Not going to be much bigger than that. We've got some really cool eastern white pines. Something like mini twists. Silver color, twisted needles, great texture. That's going to look like a shrub. You know, we have with an eastern white pine would be a 50 foot tree if we grew the tree. So, a lot of cool cultivars of these for shrubs like mini twist or Niagara Falls is the best weeper I've ever seen. We, we go through quite a bit of these. I'm looking for a nice, graceful, weeping type pine I can put in a rockery or a garden that's going to give me some character, some texture, and not go up. That's a much smaller than any other weeping uh, white pine we've seen. The smallest one, and we've got a couple left still, Sea Urchin. That's a great name because I think it paints a perfect picture. I'm looking at a little tiny stiff needle pine with that silvery blue color. That's a great little little small specimen. We've got black pines like Thunderhead. You know, that's one I'm going to again have a bushier, wider habit. We've got some really nice big ones of these this year. If you want that deep, dark Japanese style pine, white candles on it, easy to prune. You could cloud prune uh, some of these types of pine into a really interesting art piece even. Uh, but Thunderhead's a, a great variety on the dwarf side. You know, again, 12 or 15 feet tall, 12 foot wide down the road. This isn't small, but if I clip candles and sculpture it, I've seen Thunderhead kept six or eight feet forever. It's a very easy one to keep much smaller than that. Now, Podocarpus is a plant typically you would see more in California. They would grow different podocarpus down in tropical areas. These are mountain totara, or mountain plum pines. So super drought tolerant. This is probably at the top of the I don't need water or much help list. Um, we get some pretty cool podocarpuses in. You'll see this one with our winter chocolate, almost purple color. That's a spectacular new one from last year uh, called Jalaco Red. But I can get some sweet color on those and a really nice short bushy habit. Easy to prune, um, but I would do that if I'm kind of doing the alpine 
rockery again low water use garden that's a great conifer choice for those <clears throat> so blue jam is a little more blue red tips another one we carry green that's winter green we would have in the spring we would have green needles with bright red new growth and then this is the newest one the jalaco red we just got in last year some cyanopodus now this is a fun plant can you see that one right there so I brought the dwarf one up. This is Piccola, which is a little dwarf one, but that's Japanese umbrella pine. So that again looks to me more tropical-ish, a different needle, much thicker. There's some really cool varieties of, of Cyanopodus that have come out here the last few years. We got a new one in called Propeller who showed up this year. We got a few plants in already. If I look down on it, the whorls of needles are actually curved a little bit. Looks like you're looking at an airplane propeller that's about ready to turn. There's some really fun, I think, varieties. And dwarf now is big on Cyanopodus. We don't have to have a 20, 30 foot tree anymore. We can pick four feet, six feet, eight feet, depending on the cultivar that we choose. So you got there, green bullet. Uh, we've got some of those, or Green Star is another one we carry that's about that size, you know, maybe four or six feet tall. We do get some tall ones still. That would be your specimen size, like Joe Cozy, a little bit narrower, but still 20 feet tall. And then lots of use around. This is one of my favorite conifers, and I think should be for a lot of gardeners, because I think these are some of the easiest ones to grow. I don't have to be bashful with hedge clippers. Those of you who like your chainsaws and the stick, we probably couldn't even do any damage with that to a U. As long as we're not cutting down to bare wood, we can clip a U and do whatever we want to. But I want formal, I want narrow, I want something low in a hedge. There's a lot of options for Irish U, English U, Japanese U's that are gonna fill some area, <coughs> give you some easy color and maintenance. I put a couple of, I think, of the more fun ones in here. Uh, this is a new one last few years called, it's got a fun name, Goldener Schwer. That's another one from, from our friends in Germany. But I'm going to have a bright yellow plant that's just going to top out about six feet. You know, I, I've done this one in pots at my house as a centerpiece, flowers around them. Very easy to grow as a little formal hedge even, or a specimen plant in the garden. So it's Goldener Schwer, about six by three, upright and narrow. And then we have even narrower. I thought I brought one of these up. There he is hiding over there. So that's one called Orange Beauty. Um, that's, a, that's another one that's really narrow. That might reach eight feet tall, one foot wide. So I've got a tiny little area. I want to break up a, you know, an open wall. I want I got a narrow pathway down my garden. I need something high to give it some presence. I use a great choice for something that you can prune easily. And those two particular Great color, a lot of yellow. I and mean, even they, they call that orange. Mine's much more orange than that this winter mm. because it almost gets an orangey yellow color to it in the winter months, back to green and bright yellow during the growing season. And again, if you don't like yellow, you've got all these things in a in a green version as well. Then if we want to go low, I've got one of these out in my sun garden. I wanted lower and bushy, like a big shrub you that's got bright yellow color. Dwarf bright gold's an excellent one that we can shear and have a very nice specimen plant with. Or even lower is the Japanese garden you. And I think I brought a little guy up here. You can see that one in the front. So that's gonna give me that dark green color with beautiful butter yellow frosting on it, especially in springtime. And that's something we would keep down there more like two, two feet tall. Something I'm gonna have a nice low evergreen with without the height. Now, I think these are pretty cool. I thought I brought one in here. Oh, he's right next to me. So this is one. We had a bunch of these down in Seattle at the the, uh, the Northwest Flower Guard Show. Anybody go around that show? And everybody looked at the booth. And I heard a couple customers, and my staff came back. Man, they thought those things were dead. So they are not dead. This is what we call winter chocolate. It's not dead brown. I think it adds character to me. So this is bright green, spring, summer, fall. When we're cold in the winter, it gets that beautiful bronzing on it. It's not dead, it's not dying, there's nothing wrong with them. You came back in a month, you would go, oh wow, that's, it is green, you don't have any brown in there at all. So it's just winter color. But of all the arbor varieties, this is a sweet plant. We get a lot of these in now. Our customers have really liked them here because it's a fun plant. The character, 
kind of a regular, very small, very slow. You could grow this in a pot. You can grow it in a small spot in the yard. I think that's a fun one. We got little guys. We got this size. We got some little bit bigger ones out there too. So that's a plant we get a bunch of because I think all of our staff here, including me, are, are big fans of Primo. That's a that's a fun little plant. Do you know if the deer eat that one? They have not, from what I've heard, because I've asked a few people I know that live out, and it's not like the arborvitae, they decide to turn into shapes for you. They have not nibbled on those tight, congested ones. I don't think they like the foliage as much. The other arborvitaes, I hate to say, yes, that would be the one conifer they tend to, tend to try to nibble on a little bit. Um, the amber gold, this is one called Jantar, so everybody knows our little green arborvitae soldiers. We all have some as a hedge at some point. I swore I never would in my yard, and guess what? I got one side covered with arborvitae because I didn't want to look at my neighbor's house. So um, it serves a purpose, it's a living fence, but I'll say this, if something like this was out back when I did my hedge 20 years ago, I probably would have picked the yellow or even maybe alternated to have some kind of fun color in there. So it's just not a plant for everybody, uh, but certainly if you're considering a screen a short hedge or even just as a single focal point that gives you the height but not the spread we do do jantar which is going to have a great yellow color to it and not just green now we get into some funky ones like frankie boy you know that's a fun plant with kind of feathery texture we've got some of those up there you can go you can go pet them as we say they kind of feel like hair a little bit i think this is one again i brought one of these in because you can see if I didn't show you how dwarf it was and I just showed you that picture, everybody who knows Washington would think Western Red Cedar, right? That's our native tree. It's everywhere. I could walk out and probably pick out 50 of them in the neighborhood here. This is the dwarf form. So if you like Western Red Cedar, being native, being tolerant of wet, that's one thing we can do where it's a little more wet. I got some great winter color. I got great fragrance just like our cedars do around here. But now I've got a shrub. I don't have to have a gigantic 50 foot tree so that may be one i have a lot of gardeners the last couple of years have taken those home because it's native -y and because it's a little more tolerant of again wetter heavier soils versus a lot of the other stuff that we've talked about needs a little better drainage now just a few left a couple hemlocks here so hemlock again is native we have western hemlock here you know 60 feet tall we can go out hiking and find those canadian hemlock sometimes comes down into the upper parts of washington a little bit that's a canadian western canada native so we don't want i don't care either of those we don't get the gigantic 60 foot trees you can probably borrow one from mother nature if you need one of those out in the woods somewhere but we do get cool varieties of both of them for gardens um, i have coals prostrate in my yard i brought one of those up you can see that's a flat little ground cover Coles is one I can grow hemlock and shade, which is a huge benefit to me. Mine sees zero direct sun. I've had it for 20 years. It's underneath a little specimen azalea. I got grasses, I got hellebores, I got all kinds of fun stuff in that garden. But in the winter time, that gives me the structure instead of having nothing left. Azalea loses its leaves, everything else goes dormant. It would just be a bare garden of dirt. But now I get to walk out in the winter and see a really cool weeping branch of hemlock on Cole's prostrate. I like the trunk buckle. You can see in the pot there where it comes up and kind of opens the top and then we get the branches that go down. Looks really cool, I think, in the garden. Moon frost, now we get white. So I brought one of those in and you can see in the winter time even kind of pinky color. I have one of these in my shade garden as well. Across from the other hemlock, you can't, little, little, they're not too close together. But this would be a bushy type Canadian hemlock with all white new growth. So if I'm trying to brighten up a part shade or a shade garden, that foliage is going to do it for you. I've got that all through the year, but it's really going to pop back in the shade. So moon frost is going to be like a shrubby habit. I got a little gallon. I'm as cheap as anybody uh, years ago. And mine now is just maybe three feet by three feet. And it's been a long time uh, to grow in my yard. <coughs> so a moon frost, the bright white color, a little bushier. And if I want more height, we go with something like summer snow. That's one of my latest, greatest favorites. Uh, we sell quite a bit of these. 
maybe I want something 10 feet tall with all that same bright color this is going to give me a little more of a small tree proportion but again tucked at the back of a morning sun garden or somewhere that gets part shade that thing's going to glow all through the year then I can put greens and some cool plants out in front of it and I've got a really attractive little landscape there for, a, for part shade okay so that's plant overload I used to say rediscover your evergreen state because we are the evergreen state but there's a lot of fun you know we got a lot of native conifers around here anyway but I think if hopefully you saw a few on there we got a lot more out there on the yard we're on getting towards maximum selection of cool conifers right now this time of year um, you're gonna find some hopefully catches your eye you know again notice the blues notice the yellows notice the different textures and there's going to be something in there that probably will, that will be right for you I probably have different tastes than some people but there's again there's going to be something out there that's going to catch your own eye as a gardener okay so we'll do that you can always email uh, pictures or anything you'll see the web address on there but let me show you I think we got kind of everything out of here I'll show you a couple so this plant on the far left there does everyone see that Alaskan cedar so look how cool that is variegated that's a plant I might have seen like five of those plants in the last 10 years they've been really hard to come by uh, we scored this year and got about 20 of them so if you're looking for weeping Alaskan cedar which gives us that tall narrow kind of weeping specimen they're all over gardens around here there's nothing wrong with the green ones or the blue ones as well but that's a pretty cool plant I've been I've been kind of on the hunt to score us some more uh, sparkling arrows they call those so upright narrow but I've got color and I've got some cool weeping for What's the height they get uh, you'll still down the road get up there probably 20 25 feet on an old plant it's gonna take a while it's not as fast growing as the green ones but I'm always gonna have that that flecking of all that yellow in it which to me adds the cool color and does that stay year-round stays year-round you'll see that year-round absolutely yeah um, this is probably our biggest selling um, conifer if we're gonna go up for tree um, I really like slender hinoki cypress so that's that's gracilis is the name of that or slender hinoki um, that's gonna give me this and not this which I think a lot of our customers um, sweep those up we go through probably hundred and fifty of those a year um, and then we run out and we're stuck again until next next winter getting some more dug but if I want drought tolerant, full sun, you can see bronzing in the winter, some cool color. And I want 20 feet, but I only want like six foot of spread. That's the plant. You know, I sell a lot of those to people trying to break up a two-story house or need something for height, but don't want a massive ground eater that's going to eat up most of the garden. That's a great choice for a tall one, okay? Um, I think I'm going to show everything else here. Oh, I'll show you this. So... So now, just as an example for miniature, you know, that's Hinoki Cypress, that's Hinoki Cypress. So that gives you kind of in a nutshell, that particular plant, whether I do yellow, green, white, I can find, you know, I always jokingly call these moss on a rock. You'd probably, you'd probably plant this in your yard and wouldn't even notice it five years later, like, I don't know, I think it's a little bit bigger than it was. You know, I put one of these in 20 years ago it's not even up to my knee yet. I mean, it just looks like a moss on a rock, a little green rock sitting in my conifer garden on the, on the hot side of the yard. So very, very small, and then everything in between. It's the same with Japanese cedar. I think this is about the cutest little plant here in the nursery these days. This is a miniature Japanese cedar called Tenzan. I don't know that this would ever get taller than that and about that big across, and that would be a long time from now. This is like half an inch a year, you know, in the garden. So yeah, there, are, you know, there's 25 bucks. That's that's a little spendy for a tiny plant. But if I only have a small spot and I don't want to overgrow and I don't want to water it, that's a great choice for a little miniature garden. I've done these in pots. I got to find a spot in my yard for one too. I think we saw everything else except this. Did anyone look at that and say, what did he bring that thing in here for? <laughs> So the one thing again, like larch with no needles on it, right? So this is ginkgo. Does anyone have ginkgo trees? I think probably the, one of the coolest plants in nature. So ginkgo is the original conifer. I mean, we go back literally 
a couple hundred million years in history, this is the first plant that went from broadleaf to coniferous. So this still has that unique fan-shaped foliage, gorgeous gold fall color. But if you look at a ginkgo, I got a cone. That is the original conifer in the entire world. So everything else can thank the ginkgo for, for evolution when it comes down to it, because that is the original conifer that's ever existed on Earth. So we do some fun ginkgos. You know, this is Merican, which is a really cool dwarf. I mean, I just want a shrub with some character, grow in a pot, grow in the yard. We get these sometimes grafted up on a little stock. You can see uh, the one in the Smith Garden here at the nursery. He's got an old one with a huge trunk and it looks like a big patio tree on top. It's kind of fun uh, during the growing season. We also get trees. You know, the one thing with ginkgo, not to pick on the, the females, but you know, we spend time, the growers should never ever sell female ginkgo. If you ever smelt a female ginkgo when it goes into cone, it's the most disgusting smell on earth. <laughs> it smells like a sewer, literally. So we see ginkgos all male, because we make sure we get no females in here, but we have all male ginkgos. So we might not get to enjoy the cones because we don't have the female, but we're not going to have to deal with that smell. So, so American will be shrubby. We get jade butterflies, which I think is the cultivar for, I think, homeowners. I like it. Ginkgos are fun, they're different, and I don't want, you know, 50 foot tall, because I've seen ginkgos are huge. This would be like an 8 or 10 foot really cool kind of specimen plant doing jade butterflies. Then we also get tall ones, but when I go tall, I go narrow. So we get like Princeton Century is the one typically for us. I want a big tall shade tree ginkgo. I want to enjoy that bright golden fall color, but I don't want spread. I want height. So that would be the one tall tree one that we get in here uh, for tall and narrow, okay? So I think that gets all of our plants. We got information overload. We probably made it. Who's overwhelmed? <laughs> Me. No, I'm just kidding. So um, I appreciate you all coming. Um, everything is on sale for the class like usual, so you don't have to necessarily do it today. I've got lots of great staff out there to help you if you want to do some shopping. We've got almost maximum selection now. There's very few things in the conifer world that we don't have in yet. We got a lot of some stuff. Other things, there's only two or three. I would say this, if you walk by something, you're like, ooh, there's only a couple of those. It's probably because I can't get any more. Some of this stuff is really hard to come by. So some of it's a little spendier than typical shrubs, but look at the value, the growth rate, the growth size versus the cost. And I hope you'll find something you like. All the conifers are 20% off for you guys. So you just tell them you were at the class today. You don't have to do it necessarily today. You got all through the week. The sale for the class would end next Friday when we close. So you got about a week to take advantage of the sale, okay? If you want, <coughs> we're very good not here about keeping a wish list. Um, I've got a dedicated staff member that really helps us manage our wish list. Every week I check in with her. Who's been called? Did you let her know this came in? You don't have, it's not a commitment, but if there's something we run out of or something you're interested in getting in, you want to go home like I do and geek out on the Isley website for a while, you're going to find about 50 things you have to have. I'll warn you. <laughs> Joe, my employee here, shaking his head like, yeah, that's trouble. Um, and you might jot something down. I may not be able to get it today or tomorrow or a month, but at some point they will have more and I'll have your name in our system and I'll be able to secure you the cool specimen that you want to get because there is a massive amount of plants on that conifer website, I'll tell you right now, not just with them, with a lot of good growers. So there's variety. There's probably something for everybody on there, okay? Thank All right, you. thanks Thank for you. coming. Yeah.